Well, hi there, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, signing on here to WTOL.com, or perhaps you're watching from our free WTOL 11 app, maybe over on our Facebook page. Any way you put it, we're really happy you're here. I'm Tyler Paley. Tiffany Tarpley is joining us as well, along with our uh, panel, who we'll get to in just a moment for this uh, really exciting time for us, because what we're trying to do is really answer as many questions of yours as we can about the COVID-19 vaccine. We know there are so many questions, and, and really a lot of folks have very similar ones. So we figured this would be a good idea to hop on here and really get as many answered as we possibly can. So with that, let's send it over to Tiffany for uh, to introduce our, our expert panel here. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. And we have a great panel today. Um, these are our experts, our community leaders. And I think it's important, right, to hear from them so you can make um, the decision that is best for you. So first of all, I wanna introduce Tamara Bumpus. She is with the Neighborhood Health Association. She is a certified nurse practitioner, more than 16 years of medical experience as well. And Dr. Brian Dulce, a cardiologist with ProMedica and Baldemar Velasquez, he is the co-founder and president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. Uh, thank you so much to our esteemed panel. Thank you so much for being here with us and uh, taking these questions. And, and Tyler, I think it's important, you know, that we also address the fact that we want to talk about our black and brown communities today too. You know, general questions when it comes to the vaccine and the process and also um, some of the issues with um, yeah. hesitancy within our communities. Absolutely. And there are so many questions uh, from, from all people of all different walks of life, but specifically those uh, in, the in the communities of color, because there is just a whole lot of hesitancy and we want to make sure we're getting accurate facts out to our entire community. Now, with all of that said, we, we want to welcome your questions as we do this. We have people standing by right now to take your questions, send them to us and make sure the experts are able to answer as many as we can text them to us. That number is, is on your screen right now. It's 419-248-1100. If email works better, that works too. It's vaccine at WTOL.com. Or you can just comment if you're watching on Facebook and we'll try to get as many answered as possible. So with that, let's jump right into the first question. And this one comes from Brett. It was a text message to us. And I want to pose this to Dr. Dulce first. Does the vaccine stop a person from becoming infected or reduce the level of symptoms a person might get? Well, let me uh, take the second part first. Um, it definitely reduces the level of symptoms. We, we see that both the Pfizer and the uh, Moderna decrease the, uh, uh, the amount of severity. It basically eliminates severe reactions or severe illness. Um, and it does uh, um, reduce the amount of moderate and mild symptoms as well. As far as um, a person becoming, a stop it from becoming infected, um, that that that's a little bit more tricky. I'm not sure if we know the complete answer to that. We hope we're hopeful that it can decrease the um, amount of infections, but we don't know to what degree. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of where we stand with that. Um, and so I believe we want to get to our second question now as well. Um, this is uh, one that asks, if you have any of the medical issues listed um, to get the vaccine, what do you need to verify your condition? Um, are, are we in that phase yet where people who have um, underlying health conditions, um, where they can step up and get the vaccine at this point? Doctor? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I think currently we're we're doing um, first tier, second tier medical providers, teachers. So I don't think we've actually reached the point where we're going to be giving it to people with specific medical conditions just yet. Hopefully soon, within the next couple of weeks, we we will. And we we can presume that a valid medical record from their doctor would probably be sufficient for mm -hmm. proof as far as conditions, right? You would think so. Um, a last office visit note, um, a letter from your doctor stating your conditions, um, things, things like that would apply. A discharge summary from a, a recent hospitalization would, would suffice. So things of that nature, I think, would uh, definitely suffice. And I'm sure we'll be getting more guidance on that, you know, in the coming weeks and months. I want to pose our, our next question from a viewer to Tamara. And, and this asks, what percentage of the case studies were African Americans, and what percentage were obese or morbidity, morbidly obese, and African Americans who took the COVID vaccine test? Really focusing on the African American community here, as far as the trials went. 
that I am not sure of if they broke it down to obesity or if they uh, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Dulcie has some information on that. But I do know that if you don't get the vaccine, that uh, you're two to three times more likely to be hospitalized as, as opposed to if you are not black or brown, um, if you catch the coronavirus uh, COVID-19. I completely agree with that, um, and she's exactly right. I think the specific number was 2.8 times for hospitalization and death. Um, so, yeah, if you're if you're not vaccinated, you're at a higher risk of of hospitalization and death for our Black and Brown community. Um, and uh, I, I I think the other issue is that we we talked a little bit about hesitancy. Um, the data says that about only 40 percent of African Americans are are willing to get the vaccine at this point. Um, hopefully that will improve as time goes by um, as we do more investment into the community like programs like, like this. And tomorrow, I, I was gonna ask, how are you working um, to reach these communities in Baltimore, uh, Baltimore, excuse me, I believe you can answer that as well. Well, um, naturally we're speaking to our patients on a one-to-one -one basis and then outreach programs like this is uh, as one of the ways that we're reaching out. We're also, I uh, believe we're publishing, a, um, I'm writing an article on why I chose to get the uh, COVID vaccine and why I recommend everyone to get this vaccine as soon as possible so we can return back to close to normal as possible. Now, did you, did you have a, a rea reaction or did you have any issue with the vaccine? I did not. I received the, um, the, the uh, Pfizer. Uh, I didn't have any reaction at all. I get my second shot on Thursday. Um, I'm expecting maybe to get um, maybe some aches, but a lot of people have gotten their second shot, haven't had any issues. Uh, some of my patients have already gotten the, uh, the uh, oh, I forgot the other one. We've got Moderna. the Pfizer and Moderna. I got the Moderna and uh, my patients have been getting the Pfizer and I haven't had anyone with any real symptoms at all from taking the two shots. Baltimore, I wanna, I wanna ask you the next question, uh, which is from a viewer named Tina. And she says, a lot of seniors, which were supposed to be among the top priorities, uh, cannot get the vaccination. And I know there's been a lot of frustration as far as getting appointments because the supply, frankly, just doesn't meet the demand right now. What can you tell folks who are so frustrated? Do we lose Baltimore? Well, I do know that if you, um, this is tomorrow again, if you uh, continue Sorry. going online and uh, uh, keep trying, uh, slots keep opening up at uh, all the different locations. I've noticed that. Um, I know this week we are focusing on teachers and then later on in the week, I expect it to open up more to the age group, which was 65 and above. Sorry, I was on, on mute. <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> Maybe that's just a signal. I'm supposed to just shut up. But uh, nevertheless, um, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, themes, I think, that's, um, that I anticipated from the beginning because we know that low-income people have less access to health care for a number of reasons, transportation, uh, income, connections, who you know, who you don't know and uh, your ability to maneuver uh, these uh, requests you know, for appointments and so on. There's uh, uh, global complaints about uh, accessibility and access to appointments <clears throat> from low-income communities, particularly among Latinos and Blacks. And, and uh, the older people that you mentioned, uh, we, we feel like we had to advocate and uh, uh, pressure the powers that be to consider the, and actually I asked this uh, question to the governor on a Zoom call uh, a few days ago uh, with the AFL-CIO, and that's, is, it, is there any thinking uh, being done about distribution? Uh, it's okay to talk about uh, targeting the elderly on down in terms of ages, but also when you have Latinos and Blacks leading the nation in fatalities, that you got to take that into consideration as you start prioritizing how you how you distribute the vaccine, and so that these communities can have access to the vaccine. 
we did 117 vaccinations last Friday here in our office. And we pushed to have our, our, our office that immigrants and other poor people come to on a daily basis to have the, the vaccination here. And some of them are gonna be uh, rest, uh, uh, you know, not afraid, but uh, reticent to go to some medical facility or even some pharmacy to get the vaccination or try if they can get an appointment. And we've heard roundabout complaints, not only from residents, but also from veterans. Uh, we had, there's a VA clinic here in Toledo that uh, I've had complaints from veterans saying they just can't get an appointment, can't even get uh, callbacks. And so we vaccinated them here. And so I think it's important that we talk about taking the vaccine to the people as opposed to inviting the people to come to you. That's a good way to put it. I, I completely agree. Um, it, we see just basically a, a digital divide that's emerging. Um, so you've got people um, who are, are lower on the social economic uh, uh, ladder who don't have access to computers because I, I got my vaccine. And the steps that I went through to get my vaccine is I had to, number one, open up a MyChart um, uh, uh, account through Promatica. I had to download an app onto my phone and I had to keep refreshing that app until a, uh, an appointment popped up. And then once I got the appointment, obviously I needed to um, email, uh, get an email back to certify that appointment. All that kind of sets up barriers to, um, to getting a vaccine. And it sets up a digital divide, basically for the older population who may not be astute with, with, uh, with technology, people of color who may not have access to that level of, of technology, computers, laptops, things like that. So or you have access to internet. <laughs> exactly, or access to Wi-Fi and internet. So that sets up kind of a digital divide and we're seeing that play out um, in the numbers here in Ohio. Um, when I checked the numbers this morning, um, about only 5% of the people vaccinated are, are African-American, although we make up about 12% of the, the population here in the, the, the state. Um, it's similar numbers for uh, our Latino brothers and sisters. They, they made up about 3% of the people vaccinated so far in the state. So yeah, we gotta, I think we gotta step our game up and try to figure this all out because if we don't, it's gonna come back to haunt us in the end. You know, there are people who are concerned. Um, they are, you know, ready to travel, ready to get back out there. And so our next question is from Kathy. Uh, she says she is 67 years old. Um, she intends to fly to Hawaii on February 26th. And she wants to know, is she required to show a negative COVID test? And she wants to know if she receives the COVID vaccine either that week or the previous week, will it show as a positive COVID test? It would not show as a positive COVID test. Um, it would, uh, it, yes, it would not show as a positive COVID test. I believe you're right. I think the vaccine affects antibody tests, but I, I don't think uh, it would show as a as a positive actual mRNA swab type test. No. And in our previous reporting, that that aligns with what we've reported as well because of the mRNA vaccines. That essentially it's a code. It's not actually a live virus, and therefore not show up on a COVID test as you receiving COVID because they're not injecting you with a virus, right, Dr. Dolce? Yeah, that's that's correct. So it's a, it's the mRNA code, which is basically a transcription of the 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 RNA the DNA to mRNA. Um, so it's the actual code that makes the spike protein, um, not the actual live virus for the Moderna and Pfizer viruses, uh, Moderna and Pfizer Pfizer vaccines that are on the market now. Right, and that could obviously change with the Johnson and Johnson, which is made differently. Um, we we do have another question about. The, the medical side of things as well. So Tamara and, and Dr. Dulce, if you don't mind. This is from Patricia and she says, I took the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, no issues or symptoms whatsoever, but she's nervous about the second dose because she's hearing that people say the second one usually is the one with many symptoms. Is there any truth to this? And if so, can you kind of walk us through uh, what those might be, Tamara, if you wanna start? Yes, that is true. It's your body uh, developing antibodies and recognizing 
the second dose and build it so like when you get your children their vaccines and they might be a little cranky you might be a little cranky too you might um, feel a little achy um, you might have a slight temperature increase but it won't last long and I as I say each and every time that is much more preferable than getting the actual disease yeah I completely agree I got my uh, second dose about um it's been about two weeks ago. So the, the reaction I got to the second dose is I had a, a, a arm that was pretty sore um, that lasted for about four days. Um, I got fatigued, I was tired. Um, I, actually, I took an afternoon nap, <laughs> which is not you, which is not like me. But other than that, I didn't, I didn't have any other symptoms. Um, I, you know, my colleagues, some of them had a little bit of fever. Um, some of them, most everybody reported fatigue. Um, some of them felt uh, body aches, sniffles, and uh, most of the symptoms were gone within about. I think he's frozen there. I'm not sure how long the mm -hmm. symptoms, it was, I don't know if that's just me, but <laughs> <laughs> how long the symptoms last. Um, have you heard anything tomorrow about how long those symptoms last? Uh, I've heard like people say what Dr. Dolce said were a couple days to um, just a couple hours or where they spiked okay. the fever and then took a nap and woke back up and felt fine. So it's, it's all individual on in how your body reacts to this as it builds you know, up as... antibodies and, and builds up your team to, to fight this off. So if you're exposed to it, that you don't get severely ill. Um, you know, as we see more and more groups open up um, here in the state of Ohio, teachers and everything, you know, people have questions about the likelihood that they're going to be able to get both doses and in, in what could be right, the right amount of time um, that, that, you know, at least in their thinking, right, three to four weeks. So Jeff Anderson has our next question and he says that he's scheduled to get his first shot on February 15th and he wants to know what is the likelihood that the second dose will not be available at the time that he is scheduled to get that shot. Doctor, would you have any insight into that? No, <laughs> I don't think anybody really can can say that with any. We we hope that there's there's some some thought that they're going to be improving production. Um, you know, they're thinking that uh, getting distribution out a little bit quicker. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if anybody, at least I don't have that answer. Um, so we, we're hopeful. You know, as yeah, we, I, sorry, go ahead. No, I don't have any information on that. I was thinking that maybe they were holding some back, but then that was earlier in the uh, vaccine cycle that they were talking about that. Yeah, I know that I, this is just from personal experience and I have no expertise in this situation, but my dad, he was able to get the first shot. He was in the first eligible group, those over 80, but my mother who's in the over 65, um, she she hasn't been able to sign up to get her first shot, but he already has an appointment for his second shot. But it's unclear, you know. I think maybe it depends on where you are because they're in Northeast Ohio as well. So um, just to give some perspective on on his situation, where he has his second dose scheduled, uh, but my mom doesn't even have her first one scheduled. So just shows how much of a situation this is that's really in flux. I mean, so much is changing, even you know, even on a daily, perhaps an hourly basis in all of this. Our next question is from Kimberly, but before I read it, just want to remind folks, maybe just hopping on, that please send us your questions. We really want to hear uh, and ask and pose these questions to our panel of experts here. We've got three amazing folks who took an hour out of their lives today, today to come and share their perspectives and their facts and answers with you. So text them to that number on your screen, 419-248-1100. Email them. It's vaccine at WTOL.com, or you can comment on our Facebook uh, stream if you're watching it there. So this question for Kimberly and Baldemar, if you don't mind, I'd like to pose this to you first. Uh, Kimberly says she needs help about homebound people, people who simply can't leave their homes. Um, she's talking about her, her husband who takes oxygen, he's paralyzed, and she says he really needs a shot. What is, I mean, is there any guidance as far as folks who can't go to you? You were talking about bringing the vaccine to them. I know not quite the same context, but any information you have there? No, we've we've had uh, some inquiries about that here in our office, and we just don't have the staff capacity. I mean, I released my whole staff for this month, 
uh, to do this project. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it would be overwhelming to think about uh, finding one vaccine, one shot, uh, and have a doctor and a nurse go out and administer the, uh, the uh, and, uh, and apply it. Um, but we do the next best thing. If there's any way they can get that person close by to a facility uh, that's, that's in his neighborhood that's close. And we've been uh, pushing uh, for there to be sites like that in the inner city uh, that are not that close to other medical facilities where they can get uh, homebound people to uh, on, on, a, on an urgent basis. Uh, we, our heart goes out to all those people that are older like that, that are homebound and can't get the help. Uh, now there's just so much that, that, that we can do. Uh, so uh, who knows, in, in, in if I've asked uh, uh, the, the health people to rethink their uh, distribution uh, methodology, uh, I think that's gonna be one serious question that they, they might have to uh, uh, take up the challenge for. Yeah, I can't imagine Kimberly is alone in that. In fact, in our last one, a lot of folks were asking about just this topic. So clearly some, some progress to be made, hopefully in the coming weeks, Tiffany. Yeah, definitely. And you know what? Um, we wanna get some clarification on something that we talked about a little bit earlier in this live stream. Um, we had a previous question about people with underlying conditions. And we started to talk about, you know, being able to get a doctor's note, but we know right now in Ohio, um, they aren't really vaccinating people right now because of underlying health conditions. So we want to bring up this question from Linda, just to make sure that she has a little bit more clarity when we talk about this. She wants um, clarification. So you are saying people with underlying conditions should get a doctor's note. Should I have it written down, even though they aren't vaccinating uh, that group yet? Should she go ahead and get that and have it written down? I would imagine that your doctor or your primary care provider could just write you the order to get the uh, the COVID vaccine at that point once we have gone, um, as we keep going through these stages. Um, that's how I think that that could be handled without having you to divulge what your underlying health condition is because that's, your, that's a HIPAA issue. You don't need to, as long as you have an order, I would think that that would be sufficient. So she, should she go ahead and, and um, make those steps now? You know what I mean? So she can be ready and prepared when it's time. I don't think that that's necessary, but if it would make her feel more comfortable to have it, it certainly can't hurt. And that would be on her discharge summary or uh, any recent hospital visits or uh, anything from her doctor's office. Can't hurt to be proactive, but obviously, preaching patience is the big thing I'm hearing from all three of you. And really from, I know Tiffany, I'm sure would agree from everyone we've spoken to is, is that you just have to be patient. But as we've said, the supply just doesn't meet the demand right now. Um, our, our next question, and Dr. Dulcie, I'm gonna pose this one to you, hopefully to simplify in scientific terms as, as best you can. <laughs> question comes from Daniel. Um, he comments, if the vaccine works, why can you still get the disease and transmit it to others after being vaccinated? Yeah, so the vaccine is, is, is um, the main purpose of the vaccine is to prevent severe, moderate, and mild disease, um, and pretty much in that order. Um, so that's the, that's the only job the vaccine is, is really supposed to do. Um, so I, I think that's, you, you can still get the um, disease, or you can still get COVID, but it just decreases the severity of your reaction to it. So it basically primes your immune system to fight off this uh, uh, um, uh, virus. And so it's just you, it's not necessarily a vaccine to protect others around you, it's you and, and that's why 70 to 75% of folks will need to get this in order for it to be effective. Right. And that's, so what you're talking about is reaching what we call herd immunity. Um, and we're thinking at least 70, 75, if not closer to 80 percent of people need to become vaccinated or have had the disease in order for us to reach that herd immunity. And that's going to prevent um, uh, you from getting sick or you basically getting a severe reaction to the virus. Um, we, we don't completely know if it's going to decrease your risk of getting the virus um, or transmitting it. We're, we're hopeful, but we don't, we don't know that answer completely yet. 
Um, we wanted to get to the next question now. Um, questions over uh, the first dose compared to the second dose. Uh, doctor, I don't know if you have any um, insight into this as well. Um, is the first and second vaccine, is, is it the same, the doses, or is there a difference between the two? It, it's the same. As far as my understanding, um, it's, it's the same uh, for Pfizer and Moderna. Um, the body's reaction is, is going to be different. Um, obviously, you're going to have a little bit more of a reaction to the second dose than, than to the first. You know, this is a question actually that I just I just have in Baltimore. If you want to weigh in on this, that would be great. I, I'm curious what folks can do, or, or really just walk us through the process of signing up for a COVID vaccine. That seems to be the, the number one question right now. And I know you, Baltimore, don't control that necessarily, but from Flock's perspective, what are you guys doing, and and how are you including as many people as possible? Well. I think we were the first to uh, diversify locations where you can be uh, vaccinated. Uh, our union hall here in South Toledo has been a mecca for uh, immigrants, uh, a crossroad for people getting advice, direction, uh, recent arrived immigrants from Latin America uh, and um, uh, Mexico primarily. And um, we know that um, uh, that we can dispense a lot of information here in our office. And, uh, and for us to um, uh, facilitate this uh, vaccine here has been really important. But the question of access is another issue. You know, everybody guards the, uh, the quantity of vaccines very jealously. Uh, in Ohio, it's distributed by county, by county health departments. Uh, we've had people uh, calling us uh, right on the border of Wood County and Fulton County. Can they come in and get their vaccine here? And they've been limited just to the county. Uh, they didn't dig into Wood County's uh, uh, amount of vaccines or, or Fulton County. Uh, so there, there's some competition issues there for the vaccine. Uh, however, we really, really have to convince the, uh, the health department to um, take into consideration the, the uh, demographics of uh, Latinos and Blacks. And so um, uh, through our Black Brown Unity Coalition, uh, we had some of the members from the Black community come and get vaccinated in our uh, office. And now they're gonna have one uh, at First Church of God uh, uh, this coming uh, Sunday after we have ours on Friday. So we're able to take in a lot of people from our communities um, uh, in, uh, uh, in both, of our, both of our clinics. We have, uh, I think uh, we're hitting 200 for this Friday. And I know First Church of God is another uh, close to 100 uh, on Sunday. So to get working together, we have to convince the health officials to set aside some of those vaccines for our targeted community because we're the ones that, are, that have the highest mortality rates. Sure, uh, we want all the teachers to get vaccinated. We want all our uh, police and firefighters to be vaccinated, but many of them are a lot healthier some, than some of the older folks in our community. And we need to, we need to have a, a, a sentiment of uh, deferring to the more vulnerable people. Um, I got my first shot by accident uh, and uh, I wanted to give my shot away to other people uh, first, uh, that I felt were more vulnerable. But when the evening was over, there was uh, a couple of shots left. And you can't throw them away. You got to use them. So they might as well stick it in my arm and not throw it away. Uh, so uh, I think we have to not only educate the people that it's safe to take, but we have to educate the general public, especially the younger uh, folks that are healthy and uh, to defer their vaccine to someone else who's more vulnerable. If we had that attitude of sharing and uh, take care of the most vulnerable first, I think the distribution uh, could be uh, streamlined so that uh, we'll do that using partners in the community, the black churches, the Latino groups uh, that have uh, immediate constituencies out there that we can reach people more efficiently and they uh, connect with us more efficiently uh, to get a response uh, to their questions. Our, we've had three people on the phone constantly over the weekend receiving uh, calls on their cell phones 
and they have a good bedside manner. We converse with the people, talk to them, encourage them, and tell them to have patience when they show up. Sometimes they might have to wait 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And so I think we need to approach this with a, with a, a, a sympathetic attitude and, and a, a more congenial way instead of fighting me first and let me get mine. Now, with, with all of that said, you just mentioned 300 potential doses this weekend. What can you tell us? Are those all reserved already or can people still sign up for those? Well, we're struggling to get access to the vaccine. Uh, and so we'll know a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, but I think the health department, I know they're, they're doing that big um, uh, event at the University of Toledo uh, on Friday and Saturday. And, and if they got eight, 9,000 uh, vaccines available, hey, they, they got to cut off the two or 300 of them for, for our community. Because I'm telling you, these are people that are more vulnerable than a lot of those people that are going to show up at the University of Toledo. What's the likelihood you think that that's going to happen? Uh, if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be very unhappy. And I'm going to let people know it. Yeah, I well, I, I agree. Um, and I think Prometica is already starting to, 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 to have some negotiations and, and talking to some of the people in the African-American community, specifically the churches about what they can do to, to pitch in and, and help out. Um, I was involved in a conversation earlier today to uh, pledge some. So we'll, we'll see how that works out. Um, you know, and, and I kind of agree with uh, uh, my friend that uh, maybe some of the younger people need to say, hey, maybe it's not all about me um, and help out some of our, our, our older generations. Um, when we talk about the, the vaccine, we know that it, it definitely decreases specifically the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine, re reduces your risk of having severe illness by about 95%. So I think that's the number that's been, been out there. So um, I'm definitely wishing everybody can get the vaccine when they're able. Uh, I, I just want to say, to... go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Tiffany. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that we've been very, very fortunate uh, uh, to work with uh, Dr. Richard Pat. He's the medical director of, of our mobile migrant clinic that we go out to the farms in the summer. Uh, we took the mobile clinic out to do uh, COVID testing this last summer. And uh, I think we came up with a, 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 a prototype uh, to use that clinic uh, to uh, broaden it to a broader um, uh, uh, in intervention in, in, in vulnerable communities. Uh, he's the one also, I think, uh, doing the First Church of God uh, clinic on Sunday. And so um, we want to be able to uh, have him get the, the vaccines in order to uh, help him guide them uh, to apply to the sites that we organized for him. And I think that's going to be important. If we had more models to duplicate like that, we could reach a lot more of the people who are really vulnerable, they're gonna have less access to this vaccine. I mean, you, you're gonna have uh, some of these poor people, they wouldn't be able to get out to the University of Toledo uh, and the, uh, transportation is a problem. And like like uh, Dr. Dolce said, there's communication problems and, they, and able to uh, find their, navigate their way around these things. We gotta do everything we can to get the service to them. Yeah, that's very important. I know Neighborhood Health Association, uh, we're all, we're expecting to get the vaccine. We don't have a confirmed timeline yet, but that's part of our mission being a federally qualified healthcare center is to reach out to the underserved and um, get um, our people, our black and brown people in our underserved communities, the medications and the vaccines that they need. And so that's something we're working on. We just don't have a timeline yet. <laughs> Well, we appreciate uh, uh, Donnie Miller's uh, support in all of this. Uh, I've talked with her a couple of times and uh, some of the medical people that I've been able to talk to, I haven't talked to the big leaders in the city, by the way. Uh, and, yeah, I don't know who these folks are. They've, they've never contacted us. All I know and representing poor people for 53 years, the challenges they go through to accessing medical care and we knew, we knew this was going to be a problem. That's why we went up front and said, look, you know, we got to get some of this vaccine. Let's do it here in our office. We're not going to wait for some medical uh, facility to invite us, you know, to come to theirs. We'll never get invited. Uh, nobody's going to reach out to us. And up to this point, I haven't heard from any of these uh, 
people on the victory team or whoever. Um, uh, so it's uh, and that's okay. I'm sure they're doing the best they can. This is a very challenging situation. It's a new situation, and people are trying to navigate their way to to make it happen. And that's why you're doing the work, which is important. And so I think it's just important to reintroduce everyone for people who are just um, watching our stream this morning. Um, Baldemar Velasquez, uh, he's the co-founder and president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. Dr. Brian Dolce, a cardiologist with ProMedica, and Tamara Bumpus, she is with the Neighborhood Health Association. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we're, here, we're here talking about um, uh, our black and brown communities, as well as um, also talking about um, just general questions that people have as well. And so one of them I wanted to bring up is from Barb. And this is interesting because, you know, she was uh, concerned because she says her 96 year old father has gotten both the first and second shots and had no reaction to either. So she's wondering, is he actually making the antibodies or did it not work for him? Well, I, I would say that he's, he's, he is making the antibodies. He's just a tough guy. <laughs> you know, he's he's lucky. lucky. <laughs> he's such a lucky tough guy. Um, I, just looking at the data from the, the both the Moderna and the Pfizer trials, um, it worked across all age spectrums. So I would be, it, I'd say he, it's working. He's just a tough guy. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we are getting a lot of questions and, and my next question actually was, was very similar to that one. So I'll skip that one, but we are just getting inundated with questions. And frankly, we have been for weeks about accessing appointments. And I know none of you three necessarily handle that aspect, but I'm curious if any of you can give advice based on folks you've talked to or things you've heard from community or state leaders about how people can get access to these appointments. You know, people are spending time online. They're calling United Way. They're calling the area office on aging, trying to get appointments, but you know, they're, they're scarce. What would you advise these people to do? Keep calling. Say, keep calling, <laughs> stay diligent. Keep, keep up, um, be patient, um, but, but but be very diligent, keep it up. I'd say organize, organize mm -hmm. yourself into a group and uh, people uh, yelling collectively is, uh, they're gonna hear you uh, sooner than yelling on your own. And it's good that um, Pfizer has uh, ramped up their production rate. I believe they, they have doubled it, is that correct what I've heard? On the That's, vaccine? Yep. So they've cut their production time by 50% or effectively doubled it. Wow. Um, yeah, that's, and, and, you know, people have the, the kind of the catchphrase of the day is vaccine hesitancy and people, I, I have not run into that yet. If anything, it's the opposite. The, the, the man is outstripping the, uh, the uh, um, how, how much vaccine is out there. Um, so but I, I think also we have to make a nod to historical issues that have happened in the African American and, and brown community. Um, you know, just just to say there is a reason for people to be hesitant, um, and uh, we have to make a nod to that. And I think we have to make that extra effort to earn that trust and get people um, to uh, take this vaccine. And that'll no doubt take a lot, but you know, obviously, this is one of the one of the reasons we're doing this is for what you just said. I mean, this is really to get the facts out and make sure that everybody who wants to receive this vaccine, because we know just based on the data that this is the safest way forward at this point. We want everybody to be able to make an informed decision with the proper facts. So that's really important, Tiffany. It definitely is, and um, so I wanted to bring up this next question from Phyllis Gray. Um, I don't think it's something we've necessarily tackled um, here tonight, but she wants to know if I was COVID positive, but asymptomatic back in August, is it possible that she could have any after effects later? Um, Tamara and Dr. Dulce, I'm not sure if either of you can answer um, that question. I read where people were having um, after effects even though they had uh, very mild to no symptoms. However, I've not run across that yet in my, my practice. 
So I want to make sure that we're being specific about her question. Is she saying after effects from her initial initial infection? Um, because there is some data out there to say, there's a lot of data out there to say that people actually can have what we call long hauler symptoms, um, shortness of breath, brain fog, uh, fatigue. Um, so yeah, that that's very well documented to, in, in the literature and that people are definitely having long hauler um, effects. Now, if, she, if, is her, if her question is, can she have increased effects because of the vaccine? And is that, I just want to clarify, is that her question? I think she's talking about, so she was COVID positive back in yeah. August, but asymptomatic. So sure. maybe, I, I'm assuming, <laughs> she may have not had any issues yeah. since August. She might be wondering, okay, February is here. I'm starting to, to is she, could she have any after effects, you know, down the road, although she was asymptomatic back then? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure if anybody really um, knows, can, can she have, say, a delayed reaction to her initial? I, I've not seen that, um, but obviously this is something new. This is a novel situation. So I can't say she's definitely out of the woods 100%, but um, I can only speak to my experience so far. I think there's gonna be probably a lot of research, right? Are already happening and that's going to happen in the coming months and years yeah. definitely with all yeah. of this. But I can tell you, answered. I've seen a lot of different things that this virus causes in the acute phase, everything from blood clots to obviously the, the worst is pneumonia to uh, strokes. Um, so we see a lot of different um, effects from the virus in the acute phase. You know, the, as this pandemic continues on, as we've gotten the vaccination, a lot of people have said, yes, we've finally reached that light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. Uh, but there is still so much we have to do to prevent this virus. I, this next question it was sent to us via email, and it's the golden question that everybody's asking right now. Will we still need to wear masks after we've been vaccinated twice with both of those doses, uh, if Tamara and Dr. Dulce? Yes. Yes, you have to still yes, wear your mask absolutely. until we absolutely. reach at least uh, 85 or at least until we reach herd immunity. Yes, you need to wear your mask correctly over your mouth and over your nose. <laughs> and social distance and wash your hands and do all the mitigating factors. And that's how we ultimately get this virus under control. Um, that's but, for those, hey, but for those who say, look, I got vaccinated. I'm fine. I don't need to wear a mask. I'm back to normal life. Why is it that we do need to continue? Because it ain't about you. <laughs> you know, it, it, I think it's a great question. One more time. It ain't about you. <laughs> it's about the it's next a, man and the next man and the next woman and the next woman. And it's about preventing helping your neighbor and helping your friend. Because the, the data says that for every person that gets infected, they go on to infect at least one person. Um, so... Yeah, you gotta you gotta make sure you're staying masked up. You gotta make sure that you um, uh, uh, do all the social distancing and mitigating factors that we're doing now. And I mean, we That's just a great question. Yeah, Go we ahead. just <laughs> if got vaccinated and I didn't know any better. How would I? How would I know if I yeah. the, the virus? You know. But then I think, right? So if I get vaccinated and my parents are vaccinated, can I finally hug them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, am I safe? And so I think it, I think it's a good thing that to remind people that you still need to be careful, um, even after vaccination. I thought we'd be free, but you know, guess not. We're getting there, though. We're getting there with everyone getting vaccinated, and continuing. Yeah, I eventually think we will get there. The numbers that I saw today is about 9% of people in Lucas County have been vaccinated at least one dose so far. Um, so we're, we're, we're moving along. So um, and I think the numbers I saw were about 500 people are getting vaccinated per day. Hopefully that's going to in increase over the next weeks, months. You guys hearing similar numbers? Yeah. Uh, Tamara, are you, uh, excuse me, I'm, I, I'm going to ask a question. Tamara, uh, uh, is your clinics uh, uh, do, doing vaccinations, your your clinic sites? We are not doing vaccinations yet. We're, uh, Donnie Miller and uh, the whole team is working on getting them. It's in the timeline. I just don't know when, but that's something we are working on now. 
We're looking forward to when that happens because there's a lot of people calling. Yeah. We need to spread them out and refer them to local places yeah, where they have access to. Yes, yeah, that's the plan. It's uh, so important. Thank you. So Tyler, um, I, I'll go ahead and ask the next question. Um, this one is from Heather and she wanted to know if she had a reaction to the flu shot, does it make her more likely to have a reaction to the COVID-19 vaccine? What is the data on that? I mean, or, or should she um, stay away from it at this point? Doctor, do you have any idea? Um, you, you know, I, I don't. I know the mRNA vi uh, vaccine is, is, is not kind of a, um, a live virus or an attenuated virus. Um, so I, I don't know. I have not seen any cross reactivity between the two vaccines. So I don't know the complete and total answer to that. Um, definitely, she should talk to the people who are administering the vaccine, let them make them aware of, uh, of her reaction um, and, uh, and see what, what, what they say. I want to pose this question to Baldemar first, but this is really for all three of you. And this is, this is a question of mine, more philosophical, so feel free. This is more of an opinionated question. But what do we in the media, along with just health experts here in our community, need to do to make people of color more comfortable in getting vaccinated? Education, uh, stating facts, uh, dispelling myths. Uh, no, this is not going to alter your DNA. No, this is not going to cause uh, me to grow a third eyeball. And then yeah, just continue to uh, present the facts in a, in a manner that is uh, educational. Agreed, uh, Tamara. That's very good. Uh, I think we could add uh, to that um, the, uh, the, the question of uh, distribution. Uh, I, like I said, I think uh, there has to be the, the whole formula of um, targeting uh, the, the fatality statistics that are emerging uh, about Latinos leading the nation in that and then, and then African Americans, that, um, that some thinking has to be done about how you distribute the vaccine. And uh, I think the question of going to you know, I, I was mentioning the neighborhood clinics. The, uh, uh, it's important. We got one of uh, Tamara, one of your clinics right around the corner on South Avenue, not too far oh, yeah. from our office. So we want to we want to partner with that uh, that out uh, that outlet. Uh, but I don't. I, I I think that the the health people that are determining the distribution have to rethink that. And the reason it's important to us in the Latino community because the migrant workers will be arriving soon. And if we continue to distribute on a county basis, uh, uh, it's gonna uh, impede our ability to move our mobile clinic uh, that Dr. Pat directs uh, from labor camp to labor camp to do the vaccinations when workers arrive here. And uh, they may work in uh, Wood County, but they may come to a shopping center in Toledo uh, or a mall in Toledo. So you're talking about uh, this, you know, spreading the virus uh, by people who are migrant workers. So they need to think about the distribution part and uh, maybe target uh, entities like our mobile clinic, like they're doing our office right now, and all black churches. All that is very good. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that they're, they're, they're doing that, but they have to think more broadly about the distribution in the, in the near future. You guys in the media gotta, you gotta tell that story. You you gotta and and why uh, some of us think that uh, that's really necessary so that the health official will hear it. No doubt. More of I have more of an anecdotal question I think, and I think it's only from my personal experiences in talking to friends and family. You know, when we talk about black and brown communities, I found that older adults in my life, they want to get the vaccine. They're ready. They're ready for it where the younger ones are more, they're the ones who are more hesitant. No. They wanna see how things go. They wanna wait. I mean, what are you all seeing within these communities? Older people definitely wanna get it. Uh, they remember, I have very older patients and they remember uh, the salt vaccine or their parents talking about lining up to get that. 
they understand the importance of this and they've seen their friends and family um, get ill and they're tired of being socially isolated from their families and loved ones. So they're very motivated to get this vaccine. I, in, the, in our community, um, there's still a, a, a good segment of the Latino population that, uh, that um, adhere to old ideals in our community. Uh, remember that Mexican Americans, which is about 80, little over 80% of the Spanish speaking population in Toledo and Lucas County, um, uh, we come from a background of combination of indigenous people. Uh, so we have uh, indigenous and Spanish blood mix. We're the quote mestizo uh, uh, peoples. Uh, and, uh, and mostly of us uh, who are Mexican American, um, there's still a degree of respect for elders. Uh, and that's been a, one of the uh, cultural uh, things. So if, and, and it was good that we, that we started vaccinating the 75 and older at the first clinic and 70 and older the second one, now we're going down, uh, vaccinating the older population. They're the patriarchs and the matriarchs in our community. And, and, and people see that they're getting the shot. And we, we got a special t-shirt that we're gonna give to the health workers uh, this Friday. It's called Vacunda Tech on Flock. <laughs> you know, vaccinate yourself with Flock. And uh, we will give it out to the people in the community and allow the elders uh, in the community to lead the, to lead the case and be the example to the younger generations. And Baldemar, that, that leads me into actually a great follow-up question from Sharon, who, who had heard our conversation a few minutes ago, probably closer to a half hour ago at this point, about these clinics that Flock is setting up this weekend. And she's just wondering, are, like, can people still sign up? I know you said you were still waiting to hear some information about the amount of doses, but will that be specific to folks who you're already affiliated with? Is it open to the public? Can you kind of shed some light? Well, it's really open to everybody. I mean, we've, uh, don't, don't, don't forget that the poor white people also fall in that category. Yeah. Uh, it's not just black and brown. It's poor people who have a lack of access to health care. Uh, but it, we're particularly um, uh, want to reach the, uh, our community that's always uh, been overlooked and, and underserved. And so um, uh, they can still call our office. Um, but we're, we're completely full for this Friday. Uh, we just had to cut it off today. Uh, uh, and because of access to the vaccine, we probably could easily gotten to 400 uh, appointments uh, uh, this Friday, but we're, we're at 200 now. And, and if we have another close to 100 at, at First Church of God, uh, that's 300. And it's gonna be very difficult to pry that away from the health officials from their mass vaccination they're having at UT we don't want to make a competition out of this, but we really want to serve that community. But people should, uh, they can still call and, uh, and try to reserve uh, an appointment for the following Friday. And they call you, they call you at Flock, correct? Yes. Got it. You know, I think that this is, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of questions, I think, related to this next one. This one's from Cheryl, and she says, that her husband, she and her husband, they're 73 and they can't get an appointment. And she talks about, you know, uh, it's gonna go to 65 and above where it already is here in Ohio. And she wonders how can that make sense when they haven't been able to get theirs? Um, you know, from what I understand or what I've heard, it sounds like they aren't gonna open it up anymore past this group until, you know, the people who need to get vaccinated now uh, are gonna get vaccinated. What would you say to people like Cheryl who are concerned the fact that they should already be getting their vaccine and they can't even get that appointment. Yeah, again, I, I'd say stay diligent, keep keep at it, keep pushing. And I agree with uh, um, uh, Ms. Bass with Baltimore that um, to organize, I mean, um, uh, talk with your church, make sure you've got people that are, are um, advocating for you and, um, and stay diligent. Well, you guys, that, that will, um, suffice for tonight because we are approaching our one hour mark and that was just an overload of information but i really hope folks who signed on whether it was for just a minute or for this entire hour really learned some information from you three uh, it's been nothing but a pleasure to talk to you and kind of help get the facts out there and resources here locally in northwest ohio and southeast michigan because 
this virus is uh, something that we all want to go away as soon as possible. And I think facts are the best way to combat it. So all three of you, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. That, that'll do it. We do want to get to more of your questions. So continue to send them to us, text, email, comment. We'll try to get as many answered as we can, even if it's not here live. And we do plan to do another one of these soon. So stay tuned to our social media pages. But uh, for Tiffany Tarpley, I'm Tyler Paley. Thank you so much again for joining us and have a great night. Night.